Hey everybody, Cole here with Classic Mini DIY, and today's episode, we're gonna be starting up a mini. So, stay tuned for that. Man, what an exciting day. It is finally time to start up the turbocharged engine. Now, there are a few things that we want to iron out before we start up the car, but today's episode is all about getting prepared to do that and, of course, starting it up and seeing if it runs. Now, before we get started, I do want to mention one thing. If you guys have not heard, I am giving away an enormous turbocharged classic mini kit. That is the turbocharger, the exhaust manifold, downpipe, plenum, blow off valve, all sorts of really, really cool stuff. And to enter into that giveaway, all you have to do is head over to the merch store and pick some stuff up. Now, every $5 spent on the merch store will get you one entry into this turbo kit giveaway. And this giveaway is running until December 31st. So if this is something that you want, it's an amazing, amazing place to start your turbocharged build and to kind of kickstart that turbo build. It's almost $4,000 worth of parts and accessories to get your turbo build, you know, off the ground. So head over to the merch store, link is in the description, but let's step over to the car and start talking about what we need to do in order to get it started for the first time, because there are a few things you want to think about before you kind of dive in and send ignition and gasoline and all these different things through the new engine of your car. So jump over to the car with me. Oh, and before I forget, I want to say a huge, huge thank you to Creative Covers for sending me this car cover. It has come in really handy to have on the car and, you know, keeping this stuff safe while I'm waiting for some of the bits that I'm going to talk to you guys about here very soon. Um, so if you guys are looking for a form fitting uh, cover for your classic mini, uh, head over to Creative Cover. I have a link in my description to this car cover if you want to get this for your car. It's really, really great, super high quality, and it's UV protected, all sorts of different stuff. It's going to keep the mini safe when I'm not driving it. So let's get this off and then dive into the engine bay. I'm going to show you guys what we're working with right now. Now, for those of you who saw the turbo install video, you're probably going to notice there's a big intercooler shaped hole right up here um, missing, and I'll get into that in just a minute. Um, but we need to think about a few things before we start up this engine for the first time. Namely, we want to make sure that all of our hoses, our clamps, and all of the kind of safety and sensor items are all plugged up. We're also going to need to set the fuel pressure on this engine. Um, that is done with the regulator that's living right over here on my bulkhead. And I've got my fuel line disconnected and ready to plug up a, uh, a pressure sensor so that I can measure that and make sure it's set properly. Now, I've already filled up the car with premium fuel. That is 93 octane here. I think it's 98 Ron in most places. Um, it's all the same stuff. But I'll be running premium in this car. And you might notice that I have also installed a blow-off valve over here. Now, a couple things to think about, because one of the biggest things about a turbo car is the blow-off valve and that whole, you know, pigeon noises, blowing noises, all of those different things. Very, very cool stuff. But depending on where you are in the world, sometimes the type of blow-off valve is restricted. Luckily for me here in the US, I can do an atmospheric blow-off valve with no issues whatsoever. And the one I am running is made by GFB, that's Go Fast Bits. It's an Australian company and they make absolutely incredible quality stuff. This is what's called their hybrid blow-off valve. And I am running full atmospheric, as you can see from this nozzle right here. That is just gonna blow all of the excess boost. So basically when I let off the throttle, if I'd been spooling my turbo up, I'd have all this boost running into the engine, but the engine is no longer gonna use it because I let off the throttle. And so the intention here is that when you let off that throttle, the vacuum on this line changes right here. It creates a suction down into the pistons because now they're pulling, but there is no more air coming in. And what it allows the boost to do is instead of going into the engine, it comes out of the hole here and then out this little nozzle. 
Now, the cool thing about this hybrid blow-off valve is it has some options for you. Um, namely, you can adjust the spring rate, but it also has multiple ports. So you can run either full atmospheric, a hybrid of atmospheric and recirculating that air. And recirculating that air would look like have, would have a bung off of one of the takeoffs on this blow-off valve, and that would run onto the side with your filter. So pre-turbo, but still in a filtered space. Um, on a mini, and in my case, I have a filter sitting directly on the turbo. But in most applications, you have a tube running off of the turbo where you could recirculate that boost and that filtered air for you know another run of the turbo, which would help. Um, in theory, it helps the turbo spool up a little bit faster. In application, especially in a small bore engine like this, you aren't gonna see a huge difference, but could help a little bit. With all of that said though, um, that is a lot of additional tubing and a lot of additional work, namely work I don't need or want to do on my car right now. So I, so I am just going full atmospheric. We're gonna get tons of the pigeon noises. It's gonna be awesome. But with that out of the way, let's get our fuel pressure sensor installed here and we'll start setting our base fuel pressure. So what we're gonna be doing is installing an inline fuel pressure sensor here. Um, what might be surprising to a lot of you right now is that this uh, is not an ultra high pressure system. Most modern cars using fuel injection would have a much higher, higher PSI rating for the fuel. Because this is still a carbureted engine, you don't want your base fuel pressure to be too high. Otherwise, it's not going to work properly with this carburetor, and, uh, and you're gonna get a whole bunch of fuel passing by the float. You're gonna, it's just gonna be too much. So this pressure regulator that you can't see very well right now, but does live underneath this tubing and everything, that's what's called a rising rate fuel pressure regulator. And I'll be popping one up on the screen here so you guys can see it, but essentially what this does is it has a reading that gets connected to this plenum here, and that, as you increase your boost, is directly having a feed into that regulator and telling the regulator to increase that pressure as you generate more and more boost. Now, with the pressure regulator setup that I have here, which I'll have links to in the description, and it's also in my master parts list that I used for this whole build, all you're gonna be doing is setting the base fuel pressure and then leaving the rest to kind of regulate and adjust up as the boost pressure increases. The regulator is made specifically for and was originally made specifically for this SU carburetor. I'm sure it's used on many other things, but in my case, it's a relatively stock unit for a turbo SU carburetor like this. Now, of course, I don't have all the banjo fittings I want right now, so we're gonna be using some that are uh, less desirable, these won't be our permanent ones, but this will be good enough to set our base fuel pressure. The main thing is we just wanna prevent it from leaking and spewing fuel everywhere. Because while we're doing this, we're also gonna be checking the fuel uh, lines all throughout the car and making sure that they don't have any leaks because this is the first time we're gonna be running full pressure through those lines and of course to the SU carb, which we'll also wanna be checking to make sure there are no leaks. This is all part of the process, you know, of getting an engine started for the first time. It's, uh, you know, always a few little things to do. So that's nice and tight. That won't be leaking. Then we'll set our other hose clamp on here, which again, as I mentioned, is not the most desirable here. All right, so that should be a good setup there to start off. What I'm gonna do is send power to my fuel pump um, via the key. As you can see, all of my, well, as you might be able to see here, I don't have any spark plugs in here, and I'm not going to be spinning the engine over yet for multiple reasons, but I don't want to even try to run fuel into the chambers yet. All I'm doing is turning the key on to engage the fuel pump. That will start running. We'll see this little gauge go up, and hopefully we won't have fuel all over the place in here. So, um, good idea to have kind of some rags available just in case it does start to leak. And if it does, don't worry, just turn the key off. Fuel pump will turn off and we'll be able to set all this and fix it. Without further ado, let's see what our fuel pressure is. And let's flip this switch and see what happens.
Well, there we go. A leak, which is totally fine. That happens. So, did start leaking a little bit of fuel, which means that my hose clamp is probably not tight enough, or uh, some one of these clamps is just, it's not right. So, we'll need to fix that. So I'll do that real quick, and then we'll try this again. All right, let's try that again. Second time's the charm, right? Maybe? Looking pretty good so far. Can hear the pump whirring along in the back. And we are right at three PSI, which should be perfect. We can leave that. No leaks on this side of the house either. And I can hear the fuel returning back in the back of the pump. I heard it pump all that air out. Very, very exciting stuff. What that means is we can take the pressure sensor out and just run our line directly in. And then we can move on to the next step. Now the next thing we have here is maybe not what you thought would be next. Normally you'd be considering thinking about setting up your timing or connecting your spark plugs or making sure your intake circuit's all set up. No, no. The next thing that I am going to be thinking about is a starter. And there's a reason for this. Now before we get too deep into the situation of the starter I have here, I just want to mention that what I'm about to go over is not the most common situation. I have a bit of an unusual situation, and my friend, Paul Hickey, over at HRE IRL, if you haven't seen him, he and I do live streams every month, um, and he has an absolutely wonderful channel that you guys should all go and check out. Now, he has so wonderfully volunteered to help me with this issue, and the issue arises from a mixture of the type of flywheel I have, the type of drop housing I have, and the kind of amalgamation of those parts in relation to my engine. I have a bit of a hodgepodge engine um, as a result of upgrading things throughout the years. Now the starter has been installed and let's give it a shot. It should work pretty nicely. I didn't show the install because it is really just bolting up a starter, but you can see it fits under that intercooler really, really nicely and uh, it should work out quite well. Alrighty. So we'll check, make sure the battery is connected, looking good. It has been charging overnight and we're not in gear. The ignition is not on because I do not want any spark or anything. And let's see, let's see if this works. That is sounding great. It starts to slow down after a little bit. I think that might be down to battery voltage, um, but it's cold here. We got oil pressure. We're looking at about 70 PSI. I'm very happy with that. Um, <laughs> just the starter spinning over. Um, next step is to do a little bit of wiring. Um, you guys can probably see here that I've got a bit of a mess of wiring. The plenum sitting off to the side here and my main harness is disconnected. The reason this is all disconnected and everything is because what I am doing is wiring my AEM X-Series Lambda gauge, or my wideband gauge, I should say. I'm wiring that into the Lambda input on my ECU. If you have something like a fully fuel-injected setup, which is not what I have, but if you do have something like that, so that's a fully mapped ignition, plus managing the fueling. Having that fuel sensor is completely necessary. You need to know how much fuel is being burned. You need to know what your air fuel mixture is. All of these things contribute to making that map work properly. Now in my case, I have a carburetor. And so what I'm gonna be doing is using the wideband gauge, which is in my passenger compartment. I've got it down under the dash. It's hidden away, but it's enough for me to be able to see what my you know, current air fuel mixture is. That's gonna be great for kind of on the fly, making sure that I'm not in a lean out scenario, which is very bad on a boosted engine. But by wiring in this wideband gauge into my ECU, I'm now gonna be able to monitor and track and log the air fuel mixture at specific RPMs. Now the benefit of this is that I'm going to be able to modify my needle at various different points in its you know, lifting inside the float chamber. I'm gonna be able to polish that and change the fueling mixtures on that and know when my needle is getting too lean, when my needle is getting too rich, and if it's getting too rich, can't really make the needle smaller, but it'll help inform me which needle I need to move to. 
Now, if you guys haven't seen, I have a needle configurator tool on my website, classicminidiy.com slash technical. All of these tools are completely free to use, and this one is a needle configurator. It has basically every profile of every needle that was on an SU carburetor, and you can compare their fueling ratios, so at what point in the RPM range where it's high or low in comparison to another needle. So like a BDL versus a BBW needle will have these two different fueling profiles. I find it really, really helpful. I think you guys should check it out if that's something that you feel like you need as well, if you're kind of dialing in your SU carburetor. And I will be definitely using my own tool while I'm doing this. All of that said, I have my new wiring connectors here. And I'm not going to dive into how I'm wiring this too deeply. Basically, I'm adding a pin in the wiring diagram where it says to add the input from my AEM X-Series gauge into the DTA Fast ECU. Um, this is going to be really different depending on the type of ECU you have. So you'll want to refer to the wiring diagram for yours and determine how you get that signal. Now it's important to note that repinning or adding a pin to your ECU, good lord it's cold out here, is not the same, um, or at least it doesn't take the same style of crimping connector that you would normally see on uh, automotive electronics. It's something that uses, you know, it, that's for these tiny little pins, um, in this case for this style connector. Um, and you need a special crimping tool made for that style connector. Um, they're not expensive or anything, but it is something to keep in mind because if you don't have the right crimping tool, this is not going to get crimped properly and you're going to be in for a bad time. All right. Now with that pinned, the next step is to actually install it into the correct hole on the back of this connector. Now this connector, I don't even know what the name of it is, but it's a special type of connector um, that you can slide pins in and out of as necessary. So you don't have to take apart the whole connector just to add one more pin. You'll also notice this white wire here. That is wired into one of the ground sensor takeoffs that is part of this ECU. And so pretty straightforward. There is a little button here. Press that in. Now all the connectors inside that larger connector are loose and then this pin gets run into the 21 hole in my case um, 18 19 20 21 uh, that's of course like right in the middle big stupid hands don't like to cooperate all the time but sliding in that's good news well that took entirely too much fiddling but it is working now so now i'm gonna go ahead and tape up these wires Make this harness look a little bit nicer. Now we can run this back into the passenger compartment. This wiring can live up out of the way. Now all of this ran through a rubber grommet, which is somewhere around here. I'm gonna wrap this up and then I'm gonna show you guys how to do the base timing. All right, so with the starter installed, all of the oil piping reconnected, I also went ahead and reconnected everything here. Um, and now we have a largely complete looking engine. But the next step is actually to set something called our base timing. Now in a car with a distributor, normally what you'd be doing is putting the distributor in, setting the initial timing advance using a timing light and by turning the distributor left or right. Now, with a ignition only system like this, you have no distributor and it also means that there is no sort of mechanical system that is connecting a distributor to your camshaft or any sort of timing indicator. And on an ignition only ECU or a full mappable you know, fuel injected ECU system, you have something called a trigger position sensor or a crank trigger position sensor. There's all sorts of different kind of acronyms for this, but basically its job is to tell the ECU and the computer at what point in the revolution your engine is. And there's lots of different ways that this can be accomplished. On some minis, if you have an SPI, for example, there is a sensor that goes into your flywheel housing and reads a missing mark on the back of your flywheel. That would have been actually very convenient setup for this system, but I don't have an SPI, nor do I have that type of flywheel drop housing. Most of the time, you're gonna see a trigger position sensor with teeth that sit on your flywheel uh, crankshaft damper. 
Now looking at the whiteboard here, I have drawn a rudimentary crankshaft pulley. And as you can see, I started with flat teeth, but then I got really lazy and just decided to make it spiky. Um, but on your car, each one of these teeth will be kind of a square cutout, um, most similar to something like this. Now, a missing tooth system is pretty straightforward. You have your crankshaft pulley, and in our case, we have a 36 tooth system. So there are 36 teeth with one missing, so you're left with 35. Now this missing tooth, the whole purpose of it is to tell this sensor when the engine is at top dead center or your static timing. Now the reason it needs to know that is because it needs to know exactly when your engine is at top dead center so that it can apply the correct timing advance or retard on your engine and you know do that effectively so your car runs. Now you can see here, I had my sensor low on the pulley. This is the OG position that comes from MED that most of the kits that you will see on a mini, they'll have a bracket on the timing cover and that allows it to be mounted quite low. Now in my setup, due to the alternator that sits right here now, I had to move that sensor up. So there's a new bracket, a new sensor position, and it's reading the tooth at a different time or it's reading the missing tooth at a different time. Now that's no problem, but the ECU needs to be told a different offset from top dead center. So the position of top dead center, let's say right here. Now we knew that say this sensor down here was offset from top dead center by 80 degrees or something like that. This is just a made up number. Now, when we move the sensor up, what that means is it's closer to the original, you know, actual top dead center position, which means that this most likely is going to be less. Now there are lots of ways to figure this out, but luckily DTA has a really cool function inside the ECU software called an oscilloscope. So let's jump over to the computer and I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. Now doing this stuff is not especially exciting, but they have something called a crankshaft oscilloscope, and this will help you, one, measure to make sure that your sensor is working properly, but it's also going to help you determine that crankshaft offset for this four-cylinder wasted spark ignition system. And the way that we let this run is by cranking the engine over after selecting the gather button there. It's kind of hard to see here. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that your spark plugs are disconnected so that you are not sending any spark to the engine. And I would also recommend not having your fuel pump plugged in so that you don't send any fuel to the engine either. Um, this is just about collecting information. Your ECU needs to be on and your sensor needs to be in position. So I'm gonna do this real quick. I'm gonna crank the engine over and then I'll show you guys the results and what they all mean. This is a little hard to read only because camera, computer, and this is an old computer, so it's just what is what it is. But what you're gonna be given is a graph that looks something like this. And you'll see that each of these numbers is registering 35. If your sensor position is correct, you don't have any problems there. And what you'll see is that it is reading a missing tooth at the 35th tooth every single time. And that's good, that's what we want. Um, and if any of you have some more experience with this, feel free to post any details or comments in the comment section. I am learning all of this as we're doing it. So I'm not an expert on uh, ignition timing or anything like that. But what you'll be given here is a result or an approximate timing degree, which you can use to set the base timing. Um, and that this will only show up if your sensor is correct and you are not having any problems with it. If you are not given a result down here, it means that your sensor is probably not close enough to the teeth um, and it's not reading properly. But you can see it shows you some additional information. So we have a 36-1 tooth system and it's saying that the crank position at top dead center and it gives you two results, 18 degrees or 199 degrees. The reason you get two results is because your engine is at top dead center two times, once for compression and once for exhaust. And that's the way these wasted spark systems work. It's you have a literal wasted spark at one stroke of the engine because it's at top dead center two times, but you only need the spark one of those times. 
So what it's saying is that you either have a static timing of 18 degrees or 180 degrees out at 199. Most likely, the smaller number is gonna be your offset. You can kind of just think about this logically in terms of where your sensor is actually positioned on that crankshaft pulley. If it's way on the back, you're probably gonna use the bigger number. But if it's sitting on the front, closer or before the top dead center mark, then it's probably that smaller number. And then it mentions to check that with the timing light afterwards. But with this set, which I already have my timing set to this figure here, it means that we should be able to start the engine with this setting, assuming you're fueling and your ignition and you're getting spark everywhere else, which in my case I am. Um, so let's give this engine a start and see if we can get it running. Pull out the choke. It's quite cold here. Well, there we go. Got it started up a little bit. We need to adjust the fueling some. It is a little lean. And then keep fiddling with it. That is super exciting. That kind of just started right up. Okay, so we got it running there for a little bit. I think that there's some more tweaks and some fiddling that I have to do here. Um, I'm gonna do that and I'm gonna check back with you guys here and let you know what I did. I think that um, it's gonna take me a little bit and I don't wanna bore you here, but I'm imagining that I need to adjust my fueling a little bit. I'm not totally certain that I am getting enough fuel. Um, fuel pressure is perfect, that's fine. Um, might be fueling, might be throttle, could be ignition still. However, did have it running there at uh, the recommended timing offset for just a little bit. So we'll see, and uh, I'll be back with you guys here shortly. Alrighty, let's try this one more time. Um, I did figure out what the issue was. Um, it was pretty simple. Uh, it was a combination of two things. One, the carb was just a little too rich and the spark plugs were fouled. This is a perfect example of how sometimes it's really simple stuff that is causing heartburn and headache when you're building or working on a new engine like this. Um, and sometimes it's really simple to fix. A brand new set of four spark plugs made this work perfectly. Um, after, I, uh, after I replace them. So it's a great, great thing to keep in mind when you're building something like this. Even though there's lots of complexity here in the new stuff, sometimes it is the smallest thing, spark plugs, that are causing you headache. So with those replaced, with this cleaned up and tested, um, I'm gonna give this another go and let's see how it sounds. Um, also, one thing to keep in mind is if you are working in a garage and uh, you're testing this stuff out, don't forget to ventilate your garage. I've got a fan back there right now with the garage door partially opened underneath the exhaust. And even more importantly, make sure you have one of these made for a garage available to you at any given time. First time starting it since yesterday, so let's give it a little bit of choke here. All right, and there we go. We've got an engine running. So right now the choke is in, so it's running a little high RPM. With that choke out, it does run very, very nicely. So let's get this warmed up and then I'll let you guys give it a hear. All right, we have it up to operating temperature and it is running really, really nicely. 
Um, the microphone does usually make this sound a little tappier than you would normally expect, but don't worry, it is really nice in person. All right, ladies and gentlemen, there we have it. A freshly run in classic mini turbocharged A-series engine. Ready to drive. Well, almost. So I am over the moon with how well that was sounding. Um, everything seems to be running really well. Uh, there were a few additional tweaks I had to make in order to get it to run perfectly. Um, the timing was A-OK. -okay. Um, so a huge thank you to Turbo Cooper Sport, Steve Blakemore, for helping me out with that. He has been WhatsApping me back and forth um, for months, uh, helping me understand all of this stuff, because this is all very new to me as well. The A-series part is not as new, um, but the rest of the stuff actually is very new. Now, there will be teething pains as we start driving this around. And for those of you who are hoping there will be a driving video in this episode, I'm actually going to save that and make an entire episode about driving it, um, getting to know the turbo and how to kind of adjust the boost, which is obviously one of the best parts about owning a turbo is dialing up that boost. Some of those teething issues, just so you guys are aware, kind of full transparency. The crank position sensor down underneath here was kind of um, too far away from the teeth. I had to make that new bracket, as I mentioned, and the teeth were just too far away from that sensor. You need about one to two mil of space in between the sensor and the teeth, which it was just a little too much. But when I got those closer, I was finally able to get that oscilloscope reading that I showed you just a moment ago. Uh, dialing in the fuel has been a kind of tweaking process. Once you get it running, you get your idle mixture right, then you need to kind of drive it around and see what it's like, um, which I will cover in the next episode. Um, also, there are all sorts of little things that I'm not talking about in this episode in any sort of detail, like checking for air leaks, checking for oil leaks, checking for water leaks, all of these different things that you would normally do when starting up an engine for the first time. Same thing has to be done here, but you have to be almost even more uh, discerning and focused on this stuff because if you don't, you can run the risk of causing a lot more damage than just a naturally aspirated engine. Um, additionally, a thing that I don't know if I mentioned, but on the turbo side here, I'm running what's called actuator pressure. And that means that I am just running the, the boost line feed from the turbo over into the actuator over here. That way I'm not running an insane amount of boost to get started. You wanna start that as low as you can because you don't want to blow up your engine just while you're trying to sort things out and get the fueling right. Um, turbocharged engines, especially when you start getting into a higher boost, um, are very, very temperamental around fueling. So you are gonna to wanna to take your time with this. This is not just start the stuff up and run. I mean, this is a very old engine with some new parts. It's not gonna be easy. So, um, you know, this is about DIY, doing it yourself on this channel, but um, this is probably one of the more complex and advanced DIY things that you can do on a car. So in the next episode, I'm gonna cover things like teething issues, how to make sure that your first drive is safe, all of these different things. So make sure you tune in for that. Um, that should be coming this next Sunday. Um, hopefully, assuming I can get everything filmed. And I do wanna say a few thank yous to a few people. First off, I wanna say thank you to Go Fast Bits for providing me the blow off valve that you guys have not been able to hear yet because, well, the engine hasn't been under load. Just revving it is not gonna get that blow off valve to blow. They provided me that blow off valve for your charge. I really appreciate that. And uh, if you guys are looking for turbo parts, they have an incredible lineup of really, really high quality parts. So check out the link in my description to them. A thank you to Turbo Cooper Sport, as I said a minute ago, um, and a thank you to HRE IRL for providing me with the starter that fixed up my flywheel issues and, and got me started and running here. Um, I could not have gotten this going without you. And if any of you are interested in the turbo map that I'm using for this engine, um, I do have that as open source. I have provided that in a link in my description as well. Um, please, 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 please read the disclaimer on that engine map that is for this engine. It is targeted for this configuration. 
And while you might be able to adapt it to your engine, it is not a plug and play, but it could be a good baseline or at least something you can bring to your tuning shop um, or your dyno and help and have them use that as kind of a baseline to get you going safely and effectively. Um, but I cannot stress enough that it is not a plug and play system. You have to, have to tune it. Um, it's just a set of guidelines is probably the best way to think about it. Now, that's gonna wrap up this episode. I hope you guys really enjoyed it. I, I know it was a lot of technical stuff, but it is part of the game, part of getting this stuff started. And I think the next episode is gonna be really exciting as we're driving this car, starting to feel boost for the first time and starting to iron out all of the kind of little bits that you maybe forgot to tighten some bolts or things like that um, while you were building the engine. So thanks again for joining and you guys know the drill. Until I see you guys again, Enjoy those minis and motor on. See you on the next one.